passage here. So this is somewhat lengthy, but it's an invitation into a place that I believe God has for you to step into today. Okay? So hear the word of the Lord. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord before Eli, and the word from the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were infrequent. It happened at that time as Eli was lying down in his place. Now his eyesight had begun to grow dim, and he could not see well. And the lamp of God had not gone out yet. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was, that the Lord called Samuel, and he said, Here I am. Then he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called out yet again, Samuel. So Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he answered, I did not call my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor had the word of the Lord yet been revealed to him. So the Lord God called Samuel again for the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli discerned that the Lord was calling the boy. And Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he calls you, that you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Then the Lord came and stood and called as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. The Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel, at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. In that day I will carry out against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knew because his sons brought a curse on themselves and he did not rebuke them. Therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offerings forever. So Samuel lay down until morning, then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord, but Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, and he said, Here I am. He said, What is the word that he spoke to you? Please do not hide it from me. May God do so to you, and more also, if you have hide anything from me, all of the words that he spoke to you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him, and he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. Thus Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fail. All Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was confirmed as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh, because the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we spend time unpacking uh, longer passage of your word. I pray we are disciplined and well able to just draw upon the Holy Spirit that's within to understand and apply the passage to our lives. We pray that you would give us insight and wisdom and allow us to step into a world that's in desperate need of you just by considering your words and what you wrote down so long ago through your people to bring us a message today that we can apply in our own lives. We seek your guidance, we seek your love and affection, knowing that you are sovereign and that you are able to do far more than we could ever ask or imagine. And so in those things we bind up and ask that you would just step into the space with us for a moment to be present and available to our needs and our concerns and allow us to draw close to you and you will, as your word says, draw close to us. And in this name we pray. Amen. So there was a young lady named Liza back in mid-2008. Uh, this is taken down at St. Joseph Medical Center. And this young lady had a blood issue, a, a very rare blood disorder. And so she was in need of a blood transfusion. And so the blood transfusion was going to be obviously desperately needed very quickly. And because of that, they actually sought the help of her younger brother, who was five years old at the time, in order to get the blood transfusion, because the blood issue that she had was actually one he had had 
and survive. So he had antibodies in his blood that were available and that would help her actually with this blood condition. And so the doctor team and the parents together got with this five-year-old boy and explained the process of blood transfusion. And in doing so, he kind of understood what their expectations were and what their ask was. And his biggest concern was, would it help his sister? And they said, yes, it would. So he committed to being a part of the blood transfusion. And so the day of the blood transfusion came, they sat them side by side. And as the transfusion process began and then started working, they saw Liza's face fill with color for the first time in a long time. And the young boy's face paled just a little bit as some of the blood left him and the transfusion completed. And they began to put band-aids on both the arms of the children. And the young boy looked at the nurse and so seriously with full conviction in his heart, he said, now when am I going to die? And the nurse and the staff and the parents realized that this young boy was so submitted to the idea of being available for his sister that he was willing to die for her. My question to you is this, what does it look like to be a servant? What does it look like? What does it feel like? What, did, what should it feel like in relationship to other people? And my invite to you is this, that true servants seek godly submission above self-satisfaction, and in doing so, experience success. True servants seek godly submission above self-satisfaction, and by doing so, experience success. Because what is it in our life as a servant that we have to offer this world? We have our time, we have our money, we have our talents. But it's all predicated on this idea that we must seek First, godly submission. And that, I believe, is what the passage from 1 Samuel 3 that we just read is inviting you into. To seek godly submission. Each of you sitting here today is a servant of the Lord. If you have accepted Christ into your life, received the Holy Spirit, you are a servant of God. You are someone who is readily available to serve the Lord in your capacity. And that looks like work for some of you. That looks like retirement for some of you. That looks like raising children for some of you in your marriage. There are capacities and roles that you fulfill that you serve. But it is predicated on the idea that you submit in a godly fashion. And it's above your self-interest, above your self-indulgence. And by doing so, what we see at the end of the passage, and we'll go over this, is that you will experience success. Not an if or a maybe, you will. <clears throat> True servants seek godly submission above self-satisfaction, and by doing so, experience success. So as we go back into the text, I invite you into four observations that we can take along with us as servants of God. Because God is interworking in this passage of 1 Samuel 3, for the entire passage, he is working with his servant Samuel. He's interacting with him. And that same God that interacted with Samuel now interacts with you through the Holy Spirit that's inside of you. And we serve this triunal God, folks, that I covered last summer. He's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so if we serve a triunal God, we know that he is emphatically at work in each of your lives. So as we go back into the text, the first observation that I took away is that God operates, God is present despite your circumstances, and despite current circumstances. As we go back into the text, you read at the first beginning opening, now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord before Eli. Note here real quick that Samuel is serving the Lord. Samuel is serving the Lord. That's important to remember because in that day and age, the context of this is that Samuel, who was dedicated by Hannah because God was faithful to Hannah to bring her a child, and because of that, she dedicated him to the Lord. But he is serving the Lord. He's not serving Eli, but he's serving the Lord. 
And then the word from the Lord was rare in those days. Visions, and the word there from the original text would have been hazan. Visions were infrequent. The word of the Lord was rare and infrequent. Where in your life, in your seasons, have you felt as if God is rare and infrequent? Have you been in those places where God is seemingly rare and infrequent? Have you looked at your bank account in one season and seen your bank account at zero? Having accidents left and right, a bill unpaid, maybe taxes that are pressing in on you? Have you lost a job in a very unideal time? Are you dealing with physical things, uh, whether that's a bad back or whether that's just bad relationships? And it seems like God is so rare and infrequent, there's no way he's available to you. Maybe to somebody else, that's nice, but not to you. I invite you into a place where God is operating despite your circumstance. You may not feel like he's operating. You may not feel like he's in control despite your circumstances, and yet he is. Because that's the truth. That's what come, comes out of God's word, is that he is not rare, he is not infrequent in his operation. It might seem for all appearances that in 1 Samuel 3, the visions and the messages that God gives are rare and infrequent. But it, in fact, it showcases through this passage that he is in fact operating. He's working with his servant, despite the natural it also says, it happened that this time that as Eli was lying down in his place, now his eyesight had begun to grow dim and he could not see well. And the lamp of God had not yet gone out. As you research and, and, and read about this passage from a historical context, the framework is this, that what is being written in this passage is poetic. The very fact that Eli, who was appointed as the priest, the high priest for God's people, Israel, and supposed to be mediating, and yet he's ignoring what his sons are doing, which is really illicit, really bad behavior on the part of his sons. And yet, yet, he is going blind. He is supposed to be the person that sees God the most, and yet he is physically and spiritually in default. And so seemingly in the circumstance, the appointed one of God is not even functioning in the role he ought to be. And yet God is still working. Are you operating with people in your life that are not walking with the Lord, that are either, or walking in ignorance of the Lord, or perhaps intentionally against the Lord? Uh, passage here. So this is somewhat lengthy, but it's an invitation into a place that I believe God has for you to step into today. Okay? So hear the word of the Lord. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord before Eli, and the word from the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were infrequent. It happened at that time as Eli was lying down in his place. Now his eyesight had begun to grow dim and he could not see well. And the lamp of God had not gone out yet. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. That the Lord called Samuel and he said, Here I am. Then he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called out yet again, Samuel. So Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he answered, I did not call, my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor had the word of the Lord yet been revealed to him. So the Lord God called Samuel again for the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. Then Eli discerned that the Lord was calling the boy. And Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he calls you, that you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Then the Lord came and stood and called as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. The Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. In that day I will carry out against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knew because his sons brought a curse on themselves 
and he did not rebuke them. Therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offerings forever. So Samuel lay down until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. But Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he said, Here I am. He said, What is the word that he spoke to you? Please do not hide it from me. May God do so to you, and more also, if you have hide anything from me, all of the words that he spoke to you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. Thus Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fail. All Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was confirmed as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh, because the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we spend time unpacking a longer passage of your word, I pray we are disciplined and well able to just draw upon the Holy Spirit that's within to understand and apply the passage to our lives. We pray that you would give us insight and wisdom and allow us to step into a world that's in desperate need of you just by considering your words and what you wrote down so long ago through your people to bring us a message today that we can apply in our own lives. We seek your guidance, we seek your love and affection, knowing that you are sovereign and that you are able to do far more than we could ever ask or imagine. So in those things we bind up and ask that you would just step into the space with us for a moment to be present and available to our needs and our concerns and allow us to draw close to you and you will, as your word says, draw close to us. And in this name we pray, amen. So there was a young lady named Liza back in mid-2008, uh, this is taken down at St. Joseph Medical Center. And this young lady had a blood issue, a, a very rare blood disorder. And so she was in need of a blood transfusion. And so the blood transfusion was going to be obviously desperately needed very quickly. And because of that, they actually sought the help of her younger brother, who was five years old at the time, in order to get the blood transfusion, because the blood issue that she had was actually one he had had, and survive. So he had antibodies in his blood that were available and that would help her actually with this blood condition. And so the doctor team and the parents together got with this five-year-old boy and explained the process of blood transfusion. And in doing so, he kind of understood what their expectations were and what their ask was. And his biggest concern was, would it help his sister? And they said, yes, it would. So he committed to being a part of the blood transfusion. And so the day of the blood transfusion came, they sat them side by side, and as the transfusion process began and then started working, they saw Liza's face fill with color for the first time in a long time. And the young boy's face paled just a little bit as some of the blood left him, and the transfusion completed, and they began to put band-aids on both the arms of the children. And the young boy looked at the nurse, and so seriously, with full conviction in his heart, he said, now when am I going to die. And the nurse and the staff and the parents realized that this young boy was so submitted to the idea of being available for his sister that he was willing to die for her. My question to you is this, what does it look like to be a servant? What does it look like? What does it feel like? What, did, what should it feel like in relationship to other people? And my invite to you is this, that true servants seek godly submission above self-satisfaction and in doing so experience success. True servants seek godly submission above self-satisfaction and by doing so experience success success. Because what is it in our life as a servant that we have to offer this world? We have our time, we have our money, we have our talents. But it's all predicated on this idea that we must seek first godly 
submission. And that, I believe, is what the passage from 1 Samuel 3 that we just read is inviting you into. To seek godly submission. Each of you sitting here today is a servant of the Lord. If you have accepted Christ into your life, received the Holy Spirit, you are a servant of God. You are someone who is readily available to serve the Lord in your capacity. And that looks like work for some of you. That looks like retirement for some of you. That looks like raising children for some of you in your marriage. There are capacities and roles that you fulfill that you serve. But it is predicated on the idea that you submit in a godly fashion. And it's above your self-interest, above your self-indulgence. And by doing so, what we see at the end of the passage, and we'll go over this, is that you will experience success. Not an if or a maybe, you will. <clears throat> True servants seek godly submission above self-satisfaction, and by doing so, experience Success. So as we go back into the text, I invite you into four observations that we can take along with us as servants of God. Because God is interworking in this passage of 1 Samuel 3, for the entire passage, He is working with His servant Samuel. He's interacting with him. And that same God that interacted with Samuel now interacts with you through the Holy Spirit that's inside of you. And we serve this triunal God, folks, that I covered last summer. He's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so if we serve a triunal God, we know that He is emphatically at work in each of your lives. So as we go back into the text, the first observation that I took away is that God operates. God is present despite your circumstances. And despite current circumstances. As we go back into the text, you read at the first beginning opening, Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord before Eli. Note here real quick that Samuel is serving the Lord. Samuel is serving the Lord. That's important to remember because in that day and age, the context of this is that Samuel, who was dedicated by Hannah, because God was faithful to Hannah to bring her a child, and because of that, she dedicated him to the Lord. But he is serving the Lord. He's not serving Eli, but he's serving the Lord. And then the word from the Lord was rare in those days. Visions, and the word there from the original text would have been Hazan. Visions were infrequent. The word of the Lord was rare and infrequent. Where in your life, in your seasons, have you felt as if God is rare and infrequent. Have you been in those places where God is seemingly rare and infrequent? Have you looked at your bank account in one season and seen your bank account at zero? Having accidents left and right, a bill unpaid, maybe taxes that are pressing in on you? Have you lost a job in a very unideal time? Are you dealing with physical things uh, whether that's a bad back or whether that's just bad relationships. And it seems like God is so rare and infrequent, there's no way He's available to you. Maybe to somebody else, that's nice, but not to you. I invite you into a place where God is operating despite your circumstances. You may not feel like He's operating. You may not feel like He's in control despite your circumstances. And yet He is. Because that's the truth. That's what come, comes out of God's Word, is that He is not rare, He is not infrequent in His operation. It might seem for all appearances that in 1 Samuel 3, the visions and the messages that God gives are rare and infrequent. But it, in fact, it showcases through this passage that He is in fact operating. He's working with His servant, despite the natural it also says, it happened that this time that as Eli was lying down in his place, now his eyesight had begun to grow dim and he could not see well. And the lamp of God had not yet gone out. As you research and, and, and read about this passage from a historical context, the framework is this, that what is being written in this passage is poetic. The very fact that Eli, who was appointed as the priest, 
the high priest for God's people, Israel, and supposed to be mediating, and yet he's ignoring what his sons are doing, which is really illicit, really bad behavior on the part of his sons. And yet, yet... He is going blind. He is supposed to be the person that sees God the most, and yet he is physically and spiritually in default. And so seemingly in the circumstance, the appointed one of God is not even functioning in the role he ought to be, and yet God is still working. Are you operating with people in your life that are not walking with the Lord, that are either, or walking in ignorance of the Lord, or perhaps intentionally against the Lord? Are you working in and amidst those people? Are, you, are those people in your family? And yet you are still called to them. And it might seem rare and frequent. God may be unavailable. You might be praying really hard for someone's salvation and they're not, it's not happening, it's not occurring. But there's a persistency we need to have as servants of God despite those circumstances. Because remember, God works above the circumstances. He is still present and Available. Amen, brother. And then the last point I want to draw up in this idea that God works despite the current circumstances, He is present despite your current circumstance, is that this is a moment to draw close to God. It says, Samuel was lying in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Because remember, God in this time, in this context, was found in the ark. His presence was found in the ark, and that's where Samuel laid down near. Isn't it funny how when we hit seasons of life that are really difficult, really pressing in, really requiring a lot of us, taxing us, we, for some reason, take it on our own strength to draw away from the Lord. We say, I don't need God in this moment. I can do it on my own money, my own time, my own abilities, my own relationships. And yet the place that we ought to find ourselves as servants of God is in fact as close to the heart of the Father as you can. In the moments when life and seasons are demanding your time, attention, money, frustrations, relational strains, you should daily be drawing up into the presence of God. It's good to go to church. You need to. It's good to gather with fellow believers. It's good to pray. It's good to read your Bible. But at the end of the day, as they say, when you get with yourself alone in the moments of the night or the early morning, those are the moments you need to be chasing the heart of the Father. You need to be in prayer. You need to be close to Him. Because in the moments that demand so much of your time and the circumstances, that is when the heart of the Father needs to be so radically close to you that nothing else matters. It could be zero in your bank account and you could have a bad back and your children could be at your throat and relationships could be strained. And yet if you are close to the heart of the Father, you will let all that be a sideshow to the main attraction which is God and you on a one-way ticket together, in conversation constantly. True servants recognize and observe that God is at work despite your circumstances. He is present despite your circumstances. The second point, the second observation I want to call your attention to as servants of God that we can observe in this passage is that God calls above the confusion. God calls above the confusion. As we go back into the text at verse 4, that the Lord called Samuel and he said to him, Here I am. Then he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. And this happens three times. This happens three times. He, he thinks he's hearing Eli's voice. And remember at the beginning of the passage how I stated that Samuel is serving the Lord, not Eli? And yet Samuel is so faithful, because I'm sure at this time, Samuel was aware that Eli was going blind, that he was deficient in a physical way. And so I'm sure, thinking that he heard Eli, he was ready and available in the dead of night to come and help the person he was serving. To be ready and available. And Eli was flawed. He was not perfect. He was not working, walking a perfect walk with the Lord. And yet, Samuel was ready and available to serve his needs, despite that. My invitation to each of you as a servant of God is, in what capacities do you serve in your life? And then, do you put up certain walls with certain people when it becomes inconvenient? When it becomes less than ideal for you, do you put up walls 
that say, I'm not going to serve this person. They're not walking with the Lord. Why do I need to serve them? But if Scripture calls us to anything, it calls us to actually work heartily as for the Lord, not for man, right? So true servants recognize that calls that God calls above the chaos. Because again, remember, we're working towards working and understanding and submitting in godly fashion our lives above our own self-interest, our own self-satisfaction. If you readily put up walls in your life that say, I will serve up to this point, I will serve unless it's this person, then you are not being a true servant of what God has called you to. You are not acting in accordance with his word. Now that doesn't mean that we serve immoral things. That doesn't mean we do immoral things. Or we work with immoral people. Or, or throw ourselves in, into the fray of that. But it does mean in your workspaces, in your family, in your relationship dynamics with those who don't walk with God and know God, that you are called to serve them. Be ready and available, just like Samuel was, to serve them at an instant's notice. Because by doing so, by default, they will see that and say, man, I wonder what makes them different. You want to be different at your job? You want someone to see your work performance? You want your family to recognize those things? Be ready and available for them. This is um, very true for me when I talk about being ready and available. We have a friend of ours, Kayla and I do, a good family uh, friend of ours, uh, the Reeves, that are are in a place where they needed help with a house recently. They took up a house project. And so we have committed to helping them on several days throughout the week. But when I first initially walked in there, the question in my mind when I walked in the house was, man, you should have told me earlier that you needed help. Have you ever been in that moment where you tell someone, man, I wish you would have told me months ago that you needed help with this or that this was even an issue? But the conviction on my heart is, as soon as I asked that in my head and said, man, this person should have said this sooner, the conviction on my heart that God placed was, did you even ask a few months ago? Did you even ask? Did you make yourself available? Because too many times, I believe, we as believers, with all good intention, say, I'm here for you, I'm available to you. But you know as well as I do, someone on the receiving end of that, because you've probably been in that space before, will think of it as a bother, will think of it as an inconvenience, and so they'll clam up and say, well, you know, that's nice, that's probably more of a platitude, something you say. But scripture again makes it clear further on that we are to put our faith into action. That it's, it doesn't help us to say, go and be fed, but not feed someone, right? Are you readily available? to serve others? Are you readily available to serve your unsaved employer? Are you readily available to serve your spouse? Are you readily available to serve your children? Are we ready and available as servants of God when he calls us? So as we observe this idea that he was calling and calling and, and then all of a sudden Eli realizes it because remember, Eli was still in the capacity and role of the priest of God. And so he gets it. He finally receives that awareness that says, oh, this is God calling. He gives Samuel instruction and he gives him direct and specific instruction to offer himself and make himself readily and available for God. Just as easily and readily and available to God as he was for who he thought Eli was calling him to be. So that's the invitation. God calls above the confusion and chaos of your life, and your response should be ready and available for what he has for you. And as uh, we consider that, we close with that final thought that what the instruction is given what instruction is given to Samuel is this that he ought to say speak lord for your servant is listening in the original hebrew the word listening is very distinct it's very it's very practically applied it is an adverb of listening and then the intent is to obey the instruction given afterwards you who are parents are probably familiar with this idea did you hear what i said your child might have heard what you said, but were they really listening? I've had that contention with my parents growing up sometimes. We'd have that contention of the difference between being heard and really listening. 
because I could hear what my mom or dad was saying to me or coaching or instructing me on, but I didn't always want to receive it. That's the difference between hearing and listening. In business school, there's a model that we go through where there's a line of a model of communication. And at the first portion, there's two people having a conversation. And there's always a sender, the person giving the instruction, and then a receiver, someone receiving and taking that message in. And there's always feedback given from the receiver once they download that message and then send back feedback to that person. But in the middle of this graph, in this model, there is what we call interruptions to that message. Things that can occur that can cause both the receiver and the person sending, the sender, the message, to be interrupted, to be distracted, to be thrown off. My invitation to you is to open your ears and listen to what God is saying to you as a servant of Him. Because you might be hearing that God is saying, I need you to give to X person, or I need you to give to the church consistently. You might hear what God is saying, but are you actually putting it into practice? Are you actually applying it into your life? Or are you just saying, God, I hear you, I'll do that someday. And you think that's justified. You think that's okay. You know, I'm skating by. I've been in seasons where God was distinctly saying, you should not be doing X. And I said, I hear you, God. We'll have another conversation about it at a later date. And we postpone that which God is asking us to set into motion in the now. Are you saying, speak, Lord, your servant? Because we're all servants in this room. Are you really saying, speak, Lord, your servant is listening? Not hearing, but listening. God calls above the confusion. He is present despite your circumstances. And the third observation we can take away is that God is more interested in His holiness than your internal happiness. Amen, brother. Amen. God is more interested in His holiness. In fact, He's more interested in His holiness shining through in your life than your internalized happiness. We can see this no more clearly than if we jump back into the text from verse 10 and see that the Lord then makes this huge proclamation. His first prophetic word to Samuel is one that is harsh. It's one that's been coming up. That's one that's been promised. All before in, in um, chapter 2... It's very clear that Eli is in danger. Eli is in moral danger of the things that he's allowing his son to do, his sons to do. And he's not addressing the issue. He keeps putting it off. And so God promises that he's going to raise up someone that's going to be after his heart, a prophet. And he does so through Samuel. And the message is hard and it's not fun. Imagine being told that kind of message and said, hey, take this to this person that you semi-vaguely work for. Or there's a message for your boss, perhaps. Would you be comfortable in that place giving that message to someone right in the moment? You may or may not know them well. But if God calls you to it, you ought to respond, right? Because he's more interested in, is this servant of mine going to do that which I tell them to do? Further, Scripture says that God is after people that serve Him, both in spirit and in truth. Are you going to be someone, a servant of the Lord that serves Him in spirit and in truth? Are you going to share messages that are hard for people to hear? One area I can think no better of this that we have allowed in our church subculture is cohabitation before marriage. Somehow, we, and especially in my generation's age, have allowed the conversation of cohabitating before marriage to be something that is, yeah, it's kind of your choice. You can live with someone before you're fully married to them, you know, because you're going to, you know, even if you're engaged, you're going to get married to them, right? And yet the danger that we see in allowing this, the divorce rates spike highly, or shown to spike highly for people that cohabitate before marriage. Did you know that? That the divorce rates are higher for people that cohabitate before marriage. Yet somehow in our church subculture, the conversation shifted from this is how we ought to be living out of the word to it's kind of your choice. See, that's a hard line message for us as believers. But we are called to be distinctly different from the world. We are called to be in the world but not of the world. 
So what does that look like? It looks like God's holiness shining through us. Trumping or submit. Godly submission. They seek godly submission above self-satisfaction. And then the flip side of that is that they will experience the success. Are we seeking an agenda that is above our own personal comfort? And if it's God's direct instruction on holiness, are we being responsive and sharing that message with those that need to hear it? The gospel will be effective and in some cases offensive to those that are in sin. Because it's sin. Because it's something that can't be a part of God's kingdom and his plan for their life. And in fact, it's staunching the growth of your fellow believers not to share God's holiness with them. Not to input and address things in the right way. That doesn't mean we need to put it on blast and put them on display and publicly shame them. But Jesus never once in his ministry allowed for the message of love to overburden so much that it also invited people to right living. What did he tell many people in his capacity of ministry? He said, go and sin no more. Where are your accusers? I have none, Lord, he said to the woman caught in adultery. Well, neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. There was not an invitation to continue in the life they lived because they were living less than God called them to. They were living less than the holiness that God was asking them to step into. So how do we as true servants do anybody a good service, a godly service, if we aren't inviting them into God's holiness? John MacArthur, a noted pastor, in fact, I'm reading his version of the study Bible. He said that the devil is constantly at work with making sin less appealing, heaven less enticing, and hell less realistic. It's this idea that the devil is constantly at work, and he's not going out right and saying that this is false. He's asking you questions that cause doubt. It's what he did with Adam and Eve. He said, did God really say this? Is this really the expectation God set for you? Our response as servants should be, yes, this is authoritatively what God said to me. And God calls us to this living. And I will accept nothing less than God's verbal holiness and instruction through his word. That's the kind of servantship we should see. Amen. That's that, letting go of our self-satisfaction or our comfortability when it comes to calls of holiness. Because God is more interested in His holiness going through you than your personal happiness going in. That's the third observation. So God is present despite your circumstances. God calls above the confusion. God is more interested in His holiness in your life shining through than your personal happiness. And finally, the fourth observation we can take away, of course, is that we will experience as servants of God mission success. We will experience ministry success if we do that which we ought to be called to do. If we seek godly submission above our self-satisfaction, we will experience success. Following up, after the instruction and Samuel following that instruction to the letter and, and giving that information to Eli who says, be it as God will. It says thus in, chapter, or in verse 19, thus Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and let none of his words, it doesn't say some, it says none of his words fail. And then here's, here's that follow up. All Israel from Dan, even to Beersheba, knew they knew that Samuel was confirmed as a prophet of the Lord. Samuel experienced ministry success because he was willing to submit. He was willing to create a space where godly submission was his primary motive, his motivator. And because of that, he gave up his self-satisfaction and his personal comfort in sharing a really discomforting message to someone. And he experienced ministry success. This verse and the structure of it is actually very similar to a verse you might be familiar with in Luke 2.52. And it says that Jesus grew in stature and wisdom and gained favor with him, both God and men. 
See, these two men were after the heart of the Lord. They were after being servants. And because of it, they experienced the ministry of success. Now, I want to I want to kind of talk about this idea of success because in your mind, you might think, whatever my ministry is, whatever my season is, the success needs to be X or else it's not successful. And I want to invite you into a place as you begin to step this out and walk this out as a servant of God, that the success may not measure up to the world's idea or definition of success. You walking in whatever God is calling you to interpersonally might not equivocate to a $7 million salary. It might not look like in this moment or for some time like the person you've been prayerfully seeking and praying after will be saved right this minute. It might not look like that kind of success. But I promise you that the Lord of the harvest is at work in and through that time. And you are called to be faithful. You are called to be present. You are called to be ready and available as a servant of God. What does this look like on a very practically applied level? For my wife and I, this uh, idea of being servants who seek submission above self-satisfaction and then experience success sounds like this. Nine months ago, we had a prayer on our heart to find a house in Colorado, which as you, many of you know is expensive. But we had it in our mind to find a house, and we wanted that. Um, we wanted it for a lot of reasons, and one of those main reasons was for hosting, for hosting somebody. And so it was on our heart and mind to host. And so one of the prayers we would approach God with when, while we were searching for the house was we would pray so fervently, we would say, God, when you give us a house, we will host whoever you bring into our life to host. We will take them in, we will minister to them, we will disciple them, we will grow them, we will meet their needs. And we were so desperately praying, God, when you give us a house, we will provide a space for someone. We'll host someone. We'll practice the ministry of hospitality. That was in part, as I thought about that this week, to fulfill some of our own self-satisfaction of having a house. What God did over the next nine months was gave us that opportunity in our current space. See, we live in a two-bedroom, two-bath home, so it's not as big as a house. And yet, the invitation was in the current season. Not in something down the road, but something in the current season. And we began to see godly submission in that. And as we began to, he began to remove the hope or the desire for a home in that current season. And for the next nine months, we hosted a young lady that we got to minister to, that has blessed this church with some of her talent and time, that blesses the front range ministry through the homeschool program with Kimberly. This young lady came into our home, scared in many ways, uncertain of her ministry calling, not as aware of who the Holy Spirit was inside of her, and for nine months, we got to minister to her. We had the privilege of being a resource to her. We submitted ourselves daily to prayer and breaking of bread together. We laughed. We cried with her. And just two weeks ago, we got to move her out. And as I walked back in the night we moved her out, she always had her door closed for privacy and just because she liked her own space every now and then. But that as I walked her, as I walked back into our home, the door was open. And what I got the sense from God was a question. He said, are you going to leave the door of your heart open to the next person I have available for you? Are you ready and available for the next person that I have for you in this season? Are you ready and available for that? That, my friends, though imperfect as we are as people of God, is the invitation I put you into. The same accessibility that Kayla and I had in the privilege of walking out something that we thought looked like X because of our own self-seeking and our own self-satisfaction actually looked like Y. And we were blessed all the same. And I would say, quite frankly, all the more. 
Because God had something bigger in store. God called to us above the confusion of our own mess. He was present through that circumstance. He was more interested in developing out holiness in us and in this young lady than our personal happiness. And I would count that as I walked in on Thursday night after moving her out and seeing that door open and being a little sad. I would count that as mission success. Ministry success. And it tastes so good. And it feels so good. And it is the same invitation that the Lord calls each of you to today, right now. <coughs> Starting right now. So I want to pray over each of you that whatever call, whatever ministry opportunity you have, that you've either been putting off for whatever reason it is, out of fear, out of concern that it won't bring success, I want to discount that right now and tell you that it will be successful. And it only requires your submission. Your submission above your self-satisfaction. Let's go to the Lord.